clear policies, clear information needs of defining them and giving it to it, and a very clear culture. And the definition, as we all know, has five key aspects. Moral values, be honest, be truthful, fair. But is that enough in this age? If you're honest with the deliberate intention of hurting someone's feelings, are you being a person of integrity? These are all questions we're going to have to ask ourselves. Motives are important. They include desires, interests, ideals, doing the right thing from a wider community perspective, not just acting in self-interest, doing what we say we're going to do or what they say we'll do, and a commitment not just in thoughts and words but in deeds. The obstacle is, of course, that if you stand up for your principles, you'll probably be labelled a troublemaker fairly quickly, and at worst, you could well find yourself in the position of not having an income and losing your job. But you do have to recognise that we are professionals, and this, I think, is going to be a challenge over the next few years. The qualities we have and need are courage, perseverance, and the ability to do the right thing, achieving goals and living by our principles. As I said, on the right-hand side on our slide there, a person or organisation of integrity is likely to be honest, truthful, fair, complying with the laws, willing to change when they discover that information is different, adaptable, and willing to admit mistakes and take corrective action, and then to demonstrate consistent, credible, and predictable patterns of behaviour. But even there, there are tensions. Being open and adaptable to new or conflicting information can sometimes be perceived as inconsistent behaviour. And in order to behave with integrity and honour, your commitments may require inconsistency sometimes. But there's no magic ring for instilling integrity in organisations. We can obviously consider using a code of conduct. The organisation can look at its values. Everyone will then be on the same wavelength because you've told them what it is. But the tone still has to be set from the top. And the ICAEW has recently set a complete code for the body. We believe we've always had outstanding ethics, but we in the recent few months have been forced to relook at what we're doing and consider them across the board. And there is, of course, in the UK a legislative reason for this. We have generated the Bribery Act 2010. Uh, that ensures, or will do if we comply with it, that we comply with the OECD Convention. And there is now at the moment a huge amount. It's come into force in July 2011, as I said. And we have, are surrounded by businesses and ourselves all undertaking vast amounts of compliance assessment of do we comply. It's a great sort of income earner for the lawyers, of course. But then what isn't? But from your point of view, that act has international reach. And this, I think, is a particular problem out here. Well, not just out here, across the world. For us, there is a specific, a specific offence of bribing foreign officials, and there is an obligation on UK citizens, wherever they are located, unless the local written law says you can do something, to consider whether it's in accordance with our Act. I'm not aware of any written law in any country which says you can go around acting unethically, but that's the only circumstances in which you can't comply with our Act. A UK lawyer wrote that, as you'd appreciate. But the offences are not committed just by UK companies and their associates, but by any other body, body corporate or its associated, wherever incorporated, which carries on a business or part of it in the UK. And it includes all agents, subcontractors, which is particularly relevant to one of the companies I'm involved with, which operates around the world through distributors. How can I make sure they comply with the UK Act? But they need to. Facilitation payments are not allowed at all, and hospitality payments and promotional expenditure, which you put in all sorts of phrases, is allowed so long as it has a clear business purpose and the payment is proportionate. I suppose if you want to entertain me and take me out for a nice dinner, that's acceptable, but giving me a world cruise is probably not. But we do, this act has been created and has a worldwide impact. 
and the failure to comply has consequences. Perhaps the most serious is the risk to ours and your reputation. Very slow to build a great reputation, and it's very quick to lose. Three or four examples come to mind. Enron, which you may be surprised to know, had a fantastically well-written and well-defined code of conduct. Otherwise, people didn't all comply with it. Our MPs in the UK have a particularly strong reputation for keeping expense records. Their reputation has shot to pieces, and I'm not sure that FIFA is uh, terribly impressed with the bribery allegations. But perhaps the most logical, most famous of all, is the news of the world. Reputation was here one week and gone the next. In summary, what I'm saying is that if internationally integrity and ethics, and I believe it has, has come to the fore, it's come to the fore as being a requirement of modern business life. And it's demonstrated by vast volumes of headlines on ethics in the last year. In that area, the integrity of the CFO and the financial team in any organization is vital for businesses internationally to be able to do business with confidence. That's us. We are effectively the conscience of many of the companies and clients with whom we deal. As professionals, wherever in the world, wherever, whether we're advising businesses or in business, we are the people to whom everyone is going to look. I'd like to say we were the jewel in the crown of any organization. I'm sure we believe we are. And professional bodies like ICAW and ICAP across the globe need to ensure that they strive for the highest standards for their members and they do well to consider adopting visions and missions which are actually similar to ICAP's. ICAP's vision, which I'm going to read, the profession of chartered accountants in Pakistan should be the benchmark of professional excellence, upholding the principles of integrity, transparency and accountability. And your mission is, our mission is to achieve excellence in professional competence, add value to businesses and economy, safeguard the public interest, ensure ethical practices and good, good corporate governance while recognizing the needs of globalization. That was in the ICAP 2011 annual report. I think it's one of the reasons you've survived and it's ex extending and growing after 50 years. Your ideas are moving with the times. This is something that is actually critical. I wish your institute the very best for its next 50 years, and I'm sure you're going to go from strength to strength. Now, Chairman, if anybody wanted to ask a question, I'm quite happy to ask, answer, but uh, otherwise, thank you.